For Morningstar, I'm Jeremy Glazer. The first half of 2014 did not turn out quite as many investors had expected. Going into the year, many thought that perhaps the economy was ready to take off, that interest rates were almost certain to rise, and that stocks might take a breather after the big return seen in 2013. However, in reality, the cold weather put a chill on economic growth, interest rates actually fell, and stocks continued to rally to new record highs. This has created a vexing problem for investors, with stocks looking overvalued, bonds potentially at risk from rising rates, and with cash providing zero return, investors just don't know what to do with their money. To shed some light on what's happening in the markets and the broader economy, where investors can find value today, and how fund managers are handling this environment, we spoke to several Morningstar experts. First up was Bob Johnson, our Director of Economic Analysis. We asked him how the economy has performed so far in 2014 and if it's led him to change his forecast. Starting the year, my forecast was 2 to 2.5%, two the same forecast I've had for the last three years. And I'm still sticking with that, but it will be at the low end of that range. We obviously had a disappointing uh, first quarter that was actually down 2.9%, which will make it hard to get to the 2.5%, but it could still happen. Uh, but I really do still think we'll get to 2 I think there will be a, some inventory adjustment things that come through, uh, some improvements that we're already seeing in the second quarter. So I really do think we'll be able to get to the 2%, but now that's kind of the, kind of the top limit of where we can be, not the 2.5%. So a small change. So what's uh, driving some of this uh, underperformance? Is it weather-related? Is it just timing, yeah. or are there some real fundamental weaknesses? Uh, there are two things. Obviously, housing has been a little bit fundamentally weak, which has kind of impacted a lot of things across the board. Uh, but really, the really big negative number was probably uh, very much related to weather uh, and uncertainty uh, relative to the Affordable Care Act and exactly how that would fit in the number scheme in the year ahead. So looking across those major drivers, uh, what's kind of surprised you the most to, yes. in terms of that on the upside? Uh, absolutely by far is that manufacturing uh, is doing uh, very well and has now for kind of three, four months in a row. And again, the sad news is it's not a bigger part of the U.S. economy. It's under 10 percent of, of U.S. employment, so it's not that big a sector. On the other hand, it, it's really done well as the auto industries kind of come back, uh, you know, in the middle of the winter when, when things look so bad. They really kind of kept production up, and I was very scared about that for a while. Now we've had a strong spring selling season in autos, and that's the, the manufacturing now looks justified, and I think probably Boeing doing pretty well. And just to kind of a broader range of manufacturing industries finally beginning to do a little better, maybe a little bit more stuff is re, uh, reshored and so forth. So we've had some, some nice manufacturing numbers. So that's the nice uh, uh, upside surprise. Probably the big downside was housing that I've alluded to before. Uh, in the first quarter, as in the fourth quarter, it was actually a detraction from G the GDP calculation, wasn't, which hasn't happened uh, for a long, long time. So it's good to see it, uh, that it's finally looking in the last few weeks worth of data that housing has kind of turned the corner again. And I'm not worried. Housing will get back, uh, but it may not be as totally robust as we all thought it might be. Consumers are obviously a big part of that uh, pie. Uh, you know, in terms of GDP, what has consumer spending looked like? Uh, you know, are people scared or are they out there? They scared? are not. Uh, we've had a couple of bad numbers here and there, uh, but when you look at it three months average together and comparing year over year, uh, you can lay a ruler down. It's been 2% for the last three years and that number kind of continues. So the consumer seems to have a kind of a, a rock solid number that they kind of want to spend and they spend towards and when gasoline prices go up or something then they cut back in something else and or maybe they dip into savings a little bit and and then times get good they restock the savings a little bit uh, so really they've done a very good job of smoothing their consumption numbers incomes have been a little bit more volatile because of inflation uh, but on the other hand uh, the consumption number has really been solid and I, I feel very good that it will stay in that range Let's dive into inflation a little bit then. Uh, are you worried that we are kind of at the, at the beginning of, of a big uptick in, in, yeah. in prices, or are things going to stay stable? I think we're going to be in a relatively sterile, uh, uh, narrow range. I mean, I think we've got a few things going on. I mean, I think uh, some of the commodity issues are pushing inflation up in the short run. Uh, we've got a drought in Florida, I mean, a drought in Texas, which has hurt cattle the past several years. So, so beef's at a new record high. Uh, we've had droughts in California, which are affecting fruits, vegetables, and eventually this fall, nuts. Uh, so those will be uh, impacted. And then we've got uh, droughts in Brazil, which are affecting coffee prices. So you've got this trifecta of things that are, are affecting uh, 
uh, food prices, and then the problems in the Ukraine, and then you pile in the Iraqi situation. And now you've got a situation where, where you've got oil prices higher than we thought they were going to be. We thought they might come in a little bit with the greater uh, discoveries here in the U.S., but uh, no, that doesn't appear to be the case right now. So that's holding, uh, so that's uh, pushed oil prices up. So now, if there's one thing that changed in my forecast, I was saying 1.5 to 1.8 percent in terms of inflation. Now it looks like the numbers will be 1.8 to 2.0 for inflation this year. And that's probably even a little bit optimistic. That assumes that maybe some of things settle down uh, in, in Iraq just a little bit. Now, one region that would probably uh, like a little bit more inflation is Europe, uh, and, and the ECB has been acting to counteract that a bit. Um, but what's your take on the European economy generally, uh, and do you think the ECB's moves are, are going to be enough to kind of jumpstart uh, the Eurozone? It depends. We'll have to see how if people really take the bait. The, I mean, the key things that the ECB have done so far is to encourage banks to lend, and, and so far the lending rates in, in Europe just haven't gone up all that much. And uh, given that bank lending is a key part of their economy, a little less so here in the United States. Here we've got a bond market, a stock market, uh, all sorts of different ways that money can get in the system. But in Europe, it's kind of the banks are your main deal. And uh, unfortunately, the, the amount of money being lent out of there hasn't gone up that much yet. We're going to have to see how effective these programs are to encourage banks to lend because, you know, these banks are scared. They've got new credit requirements. Uh, and so even though they're being encouraged by the ECB to lend, uh, on the other hand, we're kind of taking it back and saying, well, but with the new capital requirements, if you go lend more money to, say, for example, to Spain or something, then, then maybe that's going to count against you a little bit. So uh, I'm not so sure that this is the final answer. And I think that eventually you may see more direct uh, quantitative easing uh, being more effective than the bank lending programs. So do you see growth in Europe uh, picking up at all, uh, or is it still a, a kind of a challenging Yeah, environment? it's a challenging environment. And I think uh, their demographics are worse than the U.S., and I kind of always think our demographics in the U.S. kind of lead to about 2 to 2.5% 2 long-term growth, not just my short-term forecast, but over the next 10 years. Uh, I think their demographics would have to argue that some, whatever our numbers are, theirs will be slightly less because their fertility rate is lower and their immigration rates are lower. So those will tend to hold back uh, the European situation. And I think they'll be a little slow for a while in Europe. I think they're, they're doing some admiral restructuring. Uh, I've seen some data recently uh, from our team out of Europe that suggests that maybe we've, we've uh, in some of the peripheral countries, that wage inflation has come way back down, and we're kind of uh, uh, doing a decent job of adjusting. So I'm feeling a little better about the European situation, uh, but uh, certainly, as you mentioned, inflation has not uh, been nearly as high as people would like it to be. It's still about a half a percent year over year. Uh, in the U.S., as I mentioned, it's over 2 percent, so it's really running quite a bit less in Europe right now. So it sounds like the ECB is, is certainly being more accommodative. At the same time, the Bank of Japan is, is expanding its monetary base uh, very aggressively. Uh, do you think that this is one of the reasons why Treasury rates have actually come up so far this year, uh, even against the backdrop of the Fed taper? Yeah, there's, a, there's probably three different things in, going on in operation here. One is uh, by the just competitive rates, uh, by the fact that the, the Europe and Japan have lowered their rates, all of a sudden U.S. interest rates look very attractive to some folks. Uh, uh, you know, you get a, a Spanish bond that trades for a, a lower yield than a U.S. bond in some cases. And, and people are going like, wait, now that doesn't make any sense. And, and so people are kind of uh, saying, maybe I'll go buy the U.S. And that's kind of depressed the rates a little bit. Now, I did talk about the variable inflation rate a little earlier. So maybe it's not quite the bargain that some of the bond traders think. Uh, the second is kind of a, a situation, uh, just technically, everybody was just so assured. There was not, I don't think I found a single forecast at the beginning of the year saying that the U.S. 10-year Treasury would go down from the, about the 3% that it was at the beginning of the year. Uh, I don't think there was a single forecast that it would go down. So a lot of bond houses, a lot of investment banks, a lot of investors positioned their whole portfolios on this concept that rates uh, were going up, and then they didn't. And now they're kind of like, oh, geez, it gets a little bit more painful each and every day, especially anybody that's got any leverage in that bet. And uh, I think we're probably seeing some of the end uh, capitulation. Maybe we go a little bit lower here, but, but you've certainly got that, that situation going on. The third is kind of a longer-term dynamic that I've been focusing on for a long time is that the long-term supply and demand for, for, for kind of funds is, is really kind of changing. I think so many of the businesses that are growing fast today are actually cash generator, unlike 50 years ago when General Motors grew, the faster they grew, the more capital they needed, and it was just intense eater of capital. 
And now somebody like a Google or Facebook, they grow faster and they generate more cash that sits in the bank. Uh, so that certainly means a, a little less corporate demand for money. And we've talked about mortgages several times, uh, that the, the more homes are being purchased for cash or by investors. So there's less need for mortgages in the economy. So that's another huge demand for capital that's continued to move down. And then uh, on the other side of the equation, people that buy bonds, we've got more and more baby boomers that say, I can't take another 50% down. Yes, it's a crummy rate of return. Yes, maybe I'll lose 5 or 10% if bond rates go back up. But at this point in my life, I cannot tolerate another 50% decline. And so that's kind of increased the demand for bonds. And, those are, and that's kind of a longer term issue, not just uh, here today and tomorrow. Uh, so those are, I think, the things that have really kind of surprised people and why rates are lower, lower than I would have thought at the beginning of the year. My um, forecast uh, was that we'd be up to 3.5% uh, uh, by the end of the year on the 10-year Treasury, which looks like kind of an outlier forecast right now, but I am sticking with it. So is there anything that can knock the Fed off its current path then? Uh, you know, anything they're seeing in the economy uh, that could uh, you know, have them rethink the, the taper, the, the pace of the taper? Well. Or change the Fed's mind. I mean, there's a few things that are going on with the Fed. I mean, I think the tapering program they view now, there were a number of people that were very, very uncomfortable in the open markets committee that, that felt about that program. And I think that those people are continuing to say that was an emergency measure. This is wrong. Our charter is to adjust short term rates and let the rest fall where it may. And we shouldn't be in the business of buying, you know, huge percentages of the mortgage bond, uh, bond securities out there. And so I think that that kind of almost no matter what tapering goes away. Uh, the bigger issue is kind of what happens with rates next year and how soon do they begin moving short term interest rates back up. And the consensus is kind of mid year uh, next year is kind of the point for that. And I think. Uh, uh, again, if inflation continues to worsen, I mentioned it's 2% year over year, a lot of that is food. But if we saw a generalized increase in inflation, I think they could step in just a little bit sooner uh, if need be. So higher inflation rates, especially in wages or whatever, would, might be one thing that would encourage them uh, to step in sooner. On the other hand, if the economy falls apart here, which I don't think it is, but if it did, uh, certainly they'd have to reconsider how long they keep it in place, and they'll do what it takes. So. So, you know, everybody says, oh, we'll have to see what the Fed does. Well, you know what? You really have to know what the economy does because they'll just follow what, the, what that does to make their decision. So most investors, you think, are too focused on, on Fed action, should be more focused on the real fundamentals. Absolutely. One of the other impacts of the tapering program uh, were on the emerging markets, and particularly last year, uh, we saw some big currency and bond movements. Uh, what do the emerging markets look like uh, so far in 2014, um, both from a fundamental level and also what has uh, you know, kind of the market performance looked like? Well, the market performance has been a little better. I mean, emerging market bonds in the first quarter anyway, were the absolutely the best performing asset class that, that, that was out there. So. Uh, clearly, as the interest rates came down uh, and the uh, taper tantrum was over, some funds actually flowed back to emerging markets, and, and uh, so that those uh, currency, uh, so that those uh, bonds and, and those stock markets did a little bit better. We were all worried about what was going to happen in the first quarter with emerging market stocks as well, and they probably did pretty, as close as to as well as, as as the U.S. stocks did. So certainly not a not a big impact there. Now, the economies have, are still a little bit dicey. I mean, I think China, if anything, everybody's thinking is growing a little bit slower. And they've actually taken some measures in China right now to kind of speed up their economy to make sure it kind of stays in that 7 to 7.5% 7 band for, for economic growth. Uh, so certainly uh, we've seen some uh, slowing in emerging market fundamentals. So if you're a U.S.-based investor then, uh, you know, what kind of impact will, say, a slowing China have on the U.S. economy, uh, you know, potentially have on the U.S. stock market? Yeah, I, th I think certainly the thing that I always remind people of, that China is only 1% of, of uh, U.S. exports. So as an economist, I can say that if China slows, it's actually probably good news for the U.S. economy as long as it doesn't get out of hand because one of the things that hurts is when China's demand is strong, it pushes up a bunch of commodities, it pushes up food prices, it pushes up oil, and that's not a, thing, a good thing for the U.S. consumer. And for the little bit of, of stuff that we shift directly to China, it's probably not worth the extra growth. Now, that's not the same 
question is if uh, S and P 500 companies, which also sell a lot into, which do sell a lot into China, but most of that stuff is manufactured somewhere in other emerging markets or in Europe, and maybe just a little bit out of the U.S. But most of the benefit that the S and P 500 companies are getting from selling into China is benefiting other countries, not the U.S. So you've got to separate the economy and U.S. jobs uh, from S and P 500 companies. What do you think one of the big surprises will be on the economic front uh, in the coming year? You know what, I think the biggest one will probably be that the, I think the U.S. economy in particular, but maybe even some other markets too, will be facing labor market shortages in the year ahead. You know, we've talked so much and the Fed has gotten so focused on the unemployment rate, but I think the real issue in the year ahead is going to be uh, a shortage of workers. And uh, you're already seeing it in a number of, of uh, industries, uh, the trucking guys all the time are talking about the average age of a truck driver is 55, that it's very hard to hire and maintain workers, and it's actually benefiting some of the larger trucking companies because they can uh, control people and have a greater uh, recruiting effort. So you're seeing that. Uh, airlines uh, and the pilots are noting that there's been a lot of retirements, and it's very hard to, for the regional airlines to kind of staff their, their forces. Anybody in manufacturing will tell you if you need a skilled craftsman that those are hard to find. Even in home building, even things as, uh, I shouldn't say as simple, but things like uh, putting up wallboard and so forth, uh, there's a shortage of people that can do that and do that well, quickly, and inexpensively. So we, in actually select markets, we've already seen uh, some shortages, and I think there's going to be more in the year ahead. And I think we're approaching a situation now uh, where we've seen the, the working age population, those people um, that are between 22 and 62, is actually going to decline. Uh, starting next year for the first time than we've seen in a long, long time. We were adding as many as a million people a year in that category uh, at the beginning of the 2000s. And now, like I say, we're actually going to start shrinking that number between 22 and 62, the typical working age population. So I think we're going to be actually talking about a working shortage when we sit down here at this meeting a year from now. Even if labor markets continue to improve, the U.S. looks set to experience pretty slow growth in the years to come. So what does this mean for equities? Do fundamentals justify today's valuations, or are stocks simply too expensive? I asked Mike Holt, he's our Global Director of Equity and Corporate Credit Research, where he sees valuation levels today. Well, right now, we see this, our stock coverage universe is being about 4% overvalued. But it's important to understand how we got there. It's not just some magic number that we pull out of a hat. We do all our research at the company level and the security level. And so for every company in our coverage universe, we're saying, what is our estimate of the intrinsic value of that firm? And how does the market price relate to that? So you get a ratio. You get, if it's slightly overvalued, it might be 1.05. If it's slightly undervalued, it might be 0.95. But what we do is we take all those companies and aggregate them up and then look at the median company. And that's where we get that 4% overvalued for the median company in our universe right now. That doesn't seem like a huge amount of overvaluation. Uh, is that vastly different from where we were uh, you know, about a year ago? Or how has that changed? I would say about a year ago, it's up about 4%. So about a year ago, we we're seeing things as pretty much fairly valued. And if you go back longer during the last 10, 12 years, you'd see it get as high as in that 15 to 20% overvalued might be the max and be as low as 25 or 30% undervalued. Now, how even is this? Uh, when you look across sectors, uh, are some sectors look like they're much more overvalued than others? Yeah, I think it's actually really interesting to go start at that market level and then go a layer deeper at the sector level, the geography level, and also the quality level. So at the sector level, you see a pretty wide divergence. So at the top, you'll see sectors like utilities and tech being at that 9 or 10% overvalued. Meanwhile, you'll see basic materials and energy sectors being right at the fairly valued mark. So there's some uh, divisions there. Uh, you mentioned uh, geographies. Uh, what parts of the world are looking a little bit uh, more attractive comparatively? So if we think our coverage universe is about 4% overvalued, in the U.S., we're actually seeing the market is about 6% overvalued. Europe's about right at our market average of 4%. And then Asia Pacific looks a little more attractive at kind of that fairly valued mark. And then uh, in terms of quality, uh, when you look at uh, higher quality companies, uh, do those seem to be uh, trading at, at a premium to lower quality ones? They, they actually are at a better value right now, which is interesting. Not something we typically see. But if you look at the U.S. market, our coverage in the U.S., you'll see no mode firms trading at about a 9% premium to what we think they're worth. Whereas if you take wide mode companies, they're trading at kind of that fairly valued, maybe 2% overvalued mark. 
So generally speaking, uh, there still are some values out there, uh, or is it really just uh, uh, very difficult to, to find places to invest right now? Well, my takeaway from this is that, on average, most many stocks are overvalued. So what that, that means is you have to really do your homework. You have to look harder. You have to really understand and do your homework to find those values. But they're out there, absolutely. But just how many values are there amongst these wide moat firms? Equity strategist Mike Hodel says that nothing looks dirt cheap, but he does think that there are a few ideas that long-term investors should consider. Everything is relative. So wide moat names may be somewhat more attractively valued than no moat names, but we still don't see a ton of just screaming bargains in the wide moat uh, segment of our coverage universe. We don't have any five-star wide moat stocks currently, for example. But we do see a number of names that have underperformed recently uh, because of issues that we don't think have an impact on, on the firm's long-term competitive positions, which creates opportunities, we think, for long-term value-oriented investors. One of the names that we think looks really attractive right now is eBay. eBay's had a number of issues come up recently with a data breach that they announced in May. Uh, they had some issues with Google search results that shifted the, the, the ranking of, of eBay's web pages somewhat. Uh, they've had an executive departure, and then you've had Amazon launch a payments platform that competes with PayPal. We don't think any of these issues necessarily has a huge impact on the firm over the long term. Even in combination, we don't think there's much of, of an issue here with the firm's long-term competitive positioning. But the stock has been weak on this sort of series of bad news. The company's you know, trading right now right around 85% of our fair value estimate, which we, you know, in the grand scheme of things, relative to the market overall, looks pretty attractive. And we think you know, eBay is that classic network effect business. That network effect remains solidly in place. And we think the market's pricing of the stock currently undervalues the technologies that eBay has at its disposal. Uh, similarly, Core Labs is a firm that uh, is in the, the oil and gas services business. They, they manage well production for oil and gas exploration companies. Uh, they've had a, a string of disappointing results also. Earlier in the year, expectations were very high for Core Labs. The stock was flying high, hitting all-time highs. Uh, since then, because of project timing, they've had their lower expectations for 2014 revenue a couple of times, which clearly has caused investors to flee the stock. Core Labs currently trades at about 85% of our fair value estimate, which again in this market looks pretty attractive. Another way to find values in this environment is to look for a trend that the broader market is underappreciating, but it's having a major impact on the competitive landscape. I spoke to Director of Consumer Equity Research Adam Fleck about how the rise of online commerce is creating new opportunities in that space. Well, if you look at the overall e-commerce space in the U.S., it's now about 6% of total retail sales, so it's a growing number. It continues to grow at a very rapid clip, double digits, 15% in the first quarter. And we see some industries more susceptible to the online threat than others. Generally, those that are more commoditized products don't have a high value in-store type of service need or where consumers don't have an immediate need for the product. Think apparel or books. These are areas that are going to be more susceptible and their moats are going to be more under threat from the online space. What firms in, in those areas do you think are, are really look like, like no moats and you're seeing a lot of deterioration there? Sure. If you look at many of the retailers, even a company like, say, Williams Sonoma, that is one of the higher quality retailers in our space, or Bed Bath & Beyond, these are very high quality, strong operators within the consumer space, but nonetheless don't have a moat in our opinion because of the threat of online. William Stoma's done a nice job building their own online channel, and certainly most competitors are trying to do that, but it's still very few switching costs in, in their core Williams uh, kitchenware. Uh, looking at uh, then those online firms, uh, you know, have they really been able to make money from this? Are they just you know, kind of selling things at cut rate prices, uh, or are they actually uh, you know, getting good returns on invested capital? Sure, if you look at Amazon, we think it has a wide economic moat, the same for eBay. These are businesses that are doing very well, of course, also investing in growth platforms. So if you look overall, one of the knocks on Amazon has been that the profitability probably hasn't been what it should be, and they don't seem concerned on growing that profitability. We think they actually will. If you look in North America, their, their operating margins are pretty strong. They continue to return that into new core investment areas like the Kindle, uh, like the Fire TV. Uh, we think those are interesting areas to continue to build the moat grow the overall ecosystem, and as we saw with the prime membership price increase, try to monetize that down the road once you've captured those consumers. 
uh, the fact that people are shopping online, uh, not news, probably not a, a big trend for people. Is this already priced into the stocks? Uh, you know, are you really finding any value uh, in some of the, the companies that could benefit from this over time? Yeah, we actually think Amazon and eBay both are currently slightly undervalued. We have four star ratings on both of them. We think the overall market underappreciates Amazon's ability to grow its margin and profitability longer term. And we think the market probably also underappreciates eBay's PayPal business. We think this is a very strong operator. Uh, eBay, of course, is known for its marketplace, but we think most of the value in that company is in its PayPal business. And it sounds like for some of these other retailers, uh, investors need to exercise quite a bit of caution. That's true, especially those that are more susceptible to the online space. We actually do, though, see value in retailers where we think there's a bit of a misperception. Some areas are naturally less susceptible to online. If you think about home improvement stores where there's a lot of value to be added from the expert network within the store, or off-price retailers like TJX that constantly turns over its inventory and draws consumers in that way, or even Dick's Sporting Goods where the touch and feel of the sporting equipment is an important decision factor in many consumers' eyes. Uh, we think these are areas that naturally lend themselves to hold off the e-commerce threat a little better. And companies like Kingfisher and Great Britain, TJX, Dick Sporting Goods, these are also four-star names that we think look attractive right now. Mike Holt thinks that investors need to understand the full impact that the U.S. energy boom is having. We've had a major energy boom in the U.S. We've got the Marcellus Shale. We've got the fracking that everybody's heard about. But what this really means is there's a ton of natural gas that's being pulled out of the ground and put into the market. And it's at 70 billion cubic feet a day. That's actually more than anybody knows what to do with today. And that has sent the prices of the companies that produce this gas tumbling. We actually think that this situation will resolve itself over the next couple of years. And what I mean by that is you've got to find a steady state for natural gas production that incentivizes uh, supply, so incentivizes people to continue pulling it out of the ground, but also incentivizes demand. So we're looking at natural gas prices to settle in at that $5, $5.40 a, a cube uh, per MCF in, in the long run. And if you look back the last couple of years, it's dipped all the way to below $2. Now it's part way, that recovery is part way, part way, it has occurred somewhat already, partially due to the, the very cold winter we had. But it's still a long journey ahead. And I think the market hasn't really rallied around this concept that the natural gas will have a sustainable price where these, EMP, these uh, exploration and production companies can produce at a profitable level. What's a firm that you think is going to benefit from these higher natural gas prices? Well, I think one firm that's really on our radar is Ultra Petroleum. And what this comes down to is we're in the middle of an energy boom. There's a lot of natural gas that's being brought to market and actually more than anybody knows what to do with right now. So that has sent prices tumbling. They're starting to recover, but they're still not in that 5 to $6 range that we think is sustainable. And that sweet spot of sustainable prices is really where you're seeing demand uh, you're seeing uh, incentives to keep producing natural gas, but you're also seeing demand, you're not seeing demand destruction. So if prices get too high, people don't want to use it. So there's a lot of ways for this story to play out, a lot of ways for natural gas pricing to go higher. First would be exports on the, on the demand side. Second would be the amount of investment going in, into industrial. So a lot of businesses are saying, oh, cheap natural gas, that's great. We can put, a, there's something like $100 billion going into the, the industrial complex around the Gulf Coast. And there's also power generation, so people switching over from coal and other more costly sources of power generation. And then on the, the supply side, you're seeing that people have to keep drilling. So this is not something we're at 70 billion cubic feet a day right now in the U.S. If we stop drilling, that would fall dramatically, even in the first year. So there's a lot of forces at work here. There's a lot of ways for this story to play out and a lot of ways to win on the natural gas thesis. Why Ultra in particular? We just we think with Ultra that the, the market isn't pricing in a very optimistic scenario around natural gas. And so it's trading about a 25% discount to our fair value estimate. And we really like their positioning. It's a very pure play on, on natural gas in terms of good acreage, uh, lots of proven reserves, good useful life of those reserves. So we see a long runway in what they're able to pull out of the ground and what they'll be able to sell it for. But of course, individuals aren't the only ones dealing with this limited opportunity set. Equity fund managers are also grappling with stretched valuations. I sat down with Russ Kennel. He's the director of manager research and also the editor of Morningstar Fund Investor Newsletter to see how managers are coping. 
There's definitely a, a muted enthusiasm, I guess is the nicest way to put it. Uh, managers are just not very enthusiastic. Most of them are continuing to buy. They're still saying we find some values here or there, but, but by and large, there's not a, a lot of enthusiasm. I think it just makes sense five years into a strong bull market, there's not a lot of great bargains out there, and we certainly hear that from most of the managers we talk to. Given how well the market's been doing, uh, have you seen any equity managers who've had some notable outperformance this year, um, any that have really underperformed uh, compared to the market? Oh uh, yeah, uh, on the outperformance side, uh, Bill Nigren, Oakmark Select, uh, doing really well with just kind of a, a wide variety of names. It's not a particular sector, but you know when you have a focused fund and uh, two or three of those names hit, uh, it can it can have really strong performance. So, uh, Nigren's one who's who's doing really well and has had, has done well in, in recent years too. On the flip side, Royce Low Price Stock, run by Whitney George, is is doing really well for a change after some years of really terrible performance. And the reason he's doing well is the fund has a lot of materials and energy stocks which had been getting hit, but they've rebounded this year and the fund is finally having a good run of performance. Uh, so what funds have uh, really lagged so far this year? Uh, you know, it's interesting. Two funds that have lagged are CGM Focus and PIMCO Total Return. And what's interesting is it's the same reason. They both bet against long-term treasuries. CGM Focus much more dramatically so, and so it's uh, like bottom percentile performance. Uh, PIMCO total return is just modestly lagging. But again, Treasuries may be the biggest surprise this year. They've really rallied, particularly the long end, just when people thought rates were going to back up again. So uh, that surprised people and it kind of wrong footed both PIMCO total return and CGM focus. Certainly, you mentioned that people are not very excited about the market. Uh, you know, where are some places where maybe people are finding values or they do think that uh, there's relatively uh, more attractive stocks? Yeah, at our conference just concluded, I would say emerging markets was maybe the one area cited most often as a place offering uh, some attractive values. Uh, the emerging market stocks have not kept pace with the U.S. or even Europe uh, in the last few years. So many are saying that you've got some good growth prospects and some reasonably priced uh, stocks, albeit with some greater risks and some greater volatility. So if you have uh, some funds that, that maybe because of their mandate can't hold a lot of cash, but some can, uh, for those managers that do have the option to be in cash, uh, have you seen people holding on to a lot of dry powder? Yeah, for sure. Uh, funds like Longleaf Partners, Small Cap has a, a lot of cash, IVA, uh, Yachtman, FPA Crescent. So a lot of the funds that can hold cash are holding large sums of cash. For the reflection of, uh, I think, that people do see the market as a little pricey and the more cautious ones who, who can hold cash, they see it as particularly pricey. Longleaf has gone so far as to say, you know, feel free to redeem because we really can't find much to buy. <laughs> so that is a good question though then. Uh, if you are an investor, uh, you know, you see this opportunity set that looks pretty bad. Uh, you know, what kind of funds do you think can thrive in this, in this type of environment? Who are some managers who, who you think will be able to do a good job? Yeah, well, it's, I, I think, it is it is a challenging environment, but it's, it's really hard to know where we're going. So I think you still just look for good managers with you know low costs and just good strategies and hope things work out. I don't think it changes too much, uh, except that maybe like the cautious funds. So I like Mutual Series. I mentioned IVA, though they're closed. Um, I think the more cautious strategies naturally have some appeal. FPA Crescent uh, is another one that has some appeal in, in these times. But I think also just good plain old stock pickers, Dodge and Cox, uh, Prime Cap, they're ones who, they don't go into cash. So if we have a bear market, they're gonna get hurt, but they are very good stock pickers. So I, I think it can also go that way as well. Looking at fund flows, where are investors putting their money? Are those cautious funds getting a disproportionate share of flows? Uh, no, to, to the contrary, uh, many times not. Uh, it's interesting we saw in May, there were some interesting flow changes. We saw uh, people getting out of equity funds and getting out of bank loan funds. I'm not sure really why that is because both have performed pretty well, um, but it's something to, to keep an eye on. It, it may just be a blip because it's only one month for equity funds, a couple months for bank loan funds. People are bailing on them. Uh, but elsewhere, people are uh, showing enthusiasm for emerging markets. I think even though the returns haven't been that good, they, they hear the macro story, emerging markets doing 
better than uh, the developed world. And so investors are still uh, buying emerging markets funds, oddly enough. Have the flows into any of these categories created an asset bloat situation or any of these funds just getting too big? You know, bank loan uh, had been getting a lot of money. And I worry a little bit about that because it's an area with much less liquidity and it's grown so much that we really don't know how it would behave in a, in a down market for bank loan funds. So if there's a lot of credit risk in bank loan funds, so let's say uh, we had uh, an economic setback that maybe hurt bank loan funds, will people redeem? And if so, uh, will it cause its own uh, downward spiral? It's possible. We just saw a blip in, in flows out of bank loan funds, not enough to be an issue, but it's really one area I'm keeping an eye on. On the fixed income front, the debate over when and how fast interest rates are going to rise remained a key question. I spoke with Eric Jacobson, our co-head of fixed income manager research, about how those fund managers are considering that question and also how individuals should think about their bond holdings today. I think there's a little bit of a, a disconnect between the reasons that people are fearful about rising rates and what Many manager, managers and economists believe, not everybody, are, are the, the most likely causes that will, may eventually trigger rate, rising rates. And what I mean by that is that there's a lot of focus on how low yields have gotten. And this idea that because they've gotten so low, they have nowhere to go but up, and they're going to go up, and they're going to, at some point, we're going to get a shock and they're going to soar. And the other side of the table are people who are saying, look, that's not going to happen unless we have an economic situation that demands it, uh, an economic situation that produces growth and inflation, whatever the case may be, enough to scare the market into selling off from an interest rate perspective. You know, there are, these are arguments that are going to continue to go on and on. Um, because the U.S. is an unusual place compared to how other bond markets work in some ways. Um, but. But that's kind of how, how we got to where we are. So rates did, in, in fact, fall this year, right. uh, you know, despite uh, the Fed taper, despite some of the other things that, that were going on. Uh, you know, how did bond managers react to this? Were their portfolios positioned to, to take advantage of this at all? I think a few more were than, were than we might have expected back, say, last year, because you started to see a little bit of, I don't want to say capitulation, that's really not the right word, but, but a few more managers being willing to say, you know, rates may stay low for a while. They could even fall a little bit. What we didn't see were a lot of bets to that degree. You know, you didn't have a, a really, you didn't have a lot of managers saying, I have a strong conviction I'm going to take on, you know, six years of duration in, in order to play this bet. But you did have, a few, like I said, a few more willing to, to say, well, I expect maybe we may want to see this. The problem is, is that nobody, because this, is, this, this interest rate thing is really the zeitgeist of the bond, you know, the retail sort of bond mutual fund story right now, no manager wants to get caught on the wrong side of it. No one wants to be the outlier that gets hurt when rates spike if everybody else is going to avoid it. So for investors who maybe were moving away from fixed income, you know, because rates could, could go up or uh, you know, were worried about duration risk, uh, you know, what should they do now? I mean, should they keep looking at kind of your regular core intermediate term bond fund? It's a really big conundrum, of course, if, you don't, if, if you're looking at putting money in that you don't have there now. Um, you, you know, here's, here's what I would say. I would back up and say, what does my portfolio look like? Do I, do I really... Do I have any bonds in it? Do I not? Why, wo why wouldn't I? And if the reason is just that you want to avoid all rising interest rate trouble, you might want to rethink that. Because the, the fact of the matter is, is that your bonds are there to provide a certain amount of insurance. If you go back and look, and I've said this many times, so it's a little bit of a broken record, but you go back and look what happened in the third quarter of 2011, and especially in 2008, when, when other kinds of assets, pretty much anything that had any risk, sold off. Treasuries rallied like crazy because it was a flight to quality. That's your insurance policy. The idea isn't, shouldn't be, I should say, to protect your entire portfolio from ever losing any money. It should be to have some balance, use that diversification. So what if your bonds are a little bit weak? If you only have you know, 10, 15 percent and the rest of your money's in highly volatile stocks, okay, so your stocks, you know, ideally your stocks go up, your bonds don't do as well, but hopefully, if you have a big risk sell-off, your equities are getting punished, 
ideally you've got some duration, some interest rate risk in that bond portfolio to, to act as an insurance policy. How about some alternatives uh, maybe to, to kind of your standard core bond funds, uh, bank loans that continue to be very popular? Uh, you know, what's happening with, with that asset class? So the issue with bank loans is, is kind of complicated because, you know, just a handful of years ago, it was a, a little bit of a simpler story because, you know, bank loans have these very short resets in terms of their interest rates. And what that means is they aren't very sensitive to, to rising rates or falling rates. And, and in, in turn, they have, generally have a lot of credit risk. Okay, so that's, that's a pretty good profile, and that's a, a lot of the reason that people have piled into them. They, they figure, I'm going to get better returns, less interest rate risk, what could be wrong with that? Well, there's two problems. One is that the, it's, the, mon the money has flowed in so strongly, and not just from retail investors, but we've also seen a revival in the uh, CLO, you know, the, the, the these big pools of money, collateralized loan obligations, sucking up, if you will, market share of, of the bank loan world. So the yields have gotten very low relative to, to what they would have been. And we, as we say, the spreads are very tight. In other words, the valuations are very high. So if you go into bank loans now, you're, they're kind of priced almost for perfection in the eyes of a lot of people. There's one other problem, which is that the big portion of this market has been issued with what are called LIBOR floors. And without getting into too much complexity and down in the weeds, bottom line is, is that a lot of these loans will not so instantly reset their higher interest rates when, if and when short-term rates go up. So if the Fed moves, for example, only by 25 basis points or only even by a half a point, these loans' interest rates are not going to go up immediately like they maybe would have in previous periods because of this so-called LIBOR floor. That's another reason why they're not the perfect uh, solution that people, I think, expect them to be. What about things like unconstrained bond or the go anywhere bond funds? Uh, where have those managers been looking to have these broader mandates? Uh, what are they finding attractive? So another area that we've talked a lot about before, the biggest issue there is when you take out the rate sensitivity of the portfolio, which is really what they've been doing. You know, they've sold these things on the basis of the idea that they have massive flexibility to bring interest rates negative, take them very, very long. I'm sorry, the duration of the portfolio, both negative and, and, and very long. In practice, they've just been keeping duration mostly pretty low because they're trying to, to stay away from that rate volatility. Without that interest rate sensitivity as, a, as a, a consistent lever of returns over time, these managers have to do something else. As you said, where are the other opportunities? There aren't a lot because valuations are very tight on anything that has yield. However, most of these funds have taken on a lot more credit risk than any kind of interest rate risk. And so one of the stats that's very interesting to look at is the average intermediate term bond fund, which is you know the core world, has about 11% in below investment grade debt as of the you know, last time we looked. If you go look at the, the non-traditional or unconstrained strategies, we're talking about about 36% on average. It's not a disaster. It's, you know, I'm not raising a red flag and saying everybody needs to get out of there. People need to understand they're taking on a lot more credit risk usually in those unconstrained strategies than they would have with their core fund. So if you are looking to kind of have that insurance policy, those unconstrained funds may not really perform like that. Those uh, credit, uh, that credit risk could come to bite you if the equity market. Right. As long as you understand that, you're going to be much more highly correlated to equities, as you just said. There's, there's a different kind of risk. If you go look at the correlations, these things are great in the sense of they don't have very much interest rate risk, but you're, taking, you're, taking, you're getting rid of one risk and taking on the other. So no free lunch there. That's exactly okay. right. So if interest rate, uh, we, we had a pretty benign interest rate uh, type of environment uh, this year with, with the rates continuing to go down, um, you know, it still seems like rates are likely to rise uh, eventually. Uh, you know, do investors need to be still thinking about that, uh, even if it's not going to be, you know, in the next year or the next two years that, that rates really start to come up significantly? So the way I look at it is this. Um, first of all, as I said before, if, you know, interest rates go for the most part, with the economy. So if you think that the economy is going to be sluggish and, ju and just chugging along, it, you probably don't want to believe that interest rates are likely to shoot up because there's, there has, has to be a catalyst, and that's usually the, the, the big one to, to watch out for. That said, um, yes, rates are very, very low. Uh, that risk is there. The biggest thing is how, how much will they go up and over what period of time? 
to the degree that it's a relatively slow process and even with some spikes in the way. But you know, if we're talking about over a handful of years, as those rates go up, more income comes into the portfolios. You know, if you go back and look at the interest rate shocks that we've had over the last you know, many, many years, most of them in hindsight haven't been you know, these big, severe double digit losses that people are used to seeing with their stocks. So, you know, I think some perspective there is probably needed. And again, the big question goes back to do you want or do you not want to have that insurance policy in your portfolio? On the municipal side, uh, there's still a lot of uh, discussion, things like the Detroit bankruptcy uh, or with uh, Puerto Rico bonds that uh, you know, continue to be on investors' minds. Um, how should people think about uh, muni bonds and, and when they might make sense or not make sense versus uh, kind of those core taxable categories? I think you know, the most obvious determinant that most people try to go by is how much of a tax advantage do you pick up. And if, you, if you're in very high tax brackets, and depending on where you live, it may make a lot of sense to, to lean pretty heavily toward munis. You do want to, of course, remember that it's, it's a much more, it's a narrower market in the sense of uh, you know, higher quality, you're, there's not as much, uh, you know, n not that you want to go down too far in quality, but you can't pick up as much yield unless you go into what may be really risky, what we call non-rated bonds, a lot of smaller projects, things that aren't widely followed, it can be kind of risky. Um, but you know, the bottom line is, is if, if, if you're paying enough taxes, it's probably worth it. The, the next issue, though, is, is you've got to sift. As, as you said, you've got Puerto Rico, you've got Detroit. You know, there are a handful of big issuers out there, Chicago, Illinois, where you've got these underlying pension obligation risks, especially, um, that, make them, you know, that make them a little dangerous. Um, you know, there's always a, an ongoing debate about individual bonds versus funds. Certainly, we could go round and round on that. I'm a big believer in funds because of the professional research. As long as you're not overpaying, and, you know, if you're hire, hiring a manager to do all that work for you at a relatively low cost, it's a pretty good idea to help you avoid those landmines. So if you do look at your portfolio, decide that uh, you really do need this insurance, uh, either be uh, core bond funds uh, or maybe munis, depending on your tax bracket. Uh, you know, what managers are doing a good job right now? What are some funds you know, investors might want to take a closer look at? So on the municipal side, we've always been a big fan of Fidelity and the way that they run their research operation and their municipal research especially. Um, you know, they've kind of haven't been as, as impressive on the, on the upside as they maybe were a couple years ago. There's a lot of reasons for that. They've been more, a little bit more careful and conservative than a lot of other shops. But overall, that's, that's a firm you really can't lose with in almost any of their municipal funds. You know, as far as the taxable universe, um, a lot of the old you know, standbys are still pretty good to, to keep an eye on. I think Dodging Cox uh, is a very good firm. We always have liked Metropolitan West, which TCW now. Um, you know, we still like what, what PIMCO has to offer. There are lots of reasons to sort of take a look and, you know, do I understand what's going on here and so forth. But, but you know, Bill Gross and that team that he has are still very, very solid. Um, so, you know, our, our, our favorites haven't really changed that much over the years. But, uh, again, it's, it's about that core exposure. You, you know, don't necessarily want to give it up. Interest rates were the only thing on fixed income investors' minds so far this year. The high-profile departure of Muhammad al Aryan from PIMCO was also a hot topic of conversation. Yeah, so I don't want to say that PIMCO is, you know, an exceptional child necessarily, but I will point out that over the years they have had turnover. It hasn't been massive. I think there's an impression that it has been. But to the degree that they've had that turnover, they've almost always had other managers waiting in the wings who were just spectacular and able to step up, fill their shoes, and, and be great. You know, I'm not saying that that's exactly what we're dealing with here. There's a little bit, it's a little bit more complex with what went on this year. But by and large, PIMCO's got a very, very deep bench. You know, there's other reasons that you may or may not want to choose PIMCO depending on, uh, you know, the, the kinds of bets you want to take. PIMCO, you know, the core funds like total return don't take on a lot of corporate risk, for example. It's much more driven by macro calls, yield curve, et cetera. And so, you, you know, a lot of people believe Blend it. They maybe take do some PIMCO total return. Maybe they own some TCW. Uh, Western Asset Management is another one that I didn't I didn't mention earlier. So um, you know there there are ways to, to combine them. But as far as as, as PIMCO goes, um, you know I think that. Um, it's always something that you want to watch in terms of manager turnover. And I think a lot of times uh, it depends on the size of the firm, too, and, and again, what those backup resources are. A smaller firm, naturally, certain kinds of turnover are going to raise a much bigger red flag. 
Russ Kennel also shared his thoughts on some other high-profile manager departures that happened so far in 2014. To me, the, the, the next headline would be Brian Rogers leaving T. Rowe Price Equity Income. He announced it well in advance. He's leaving uh, October 2015. So we have a long run-up. Uh, but even so, that will be 30 years, and he's done a great job. He's going to be replaced by John Linehan, who's done a pretty good job at T. Rowe Price Value up until 2009, and then he took a more senior oversight role. Now he's coming back to portfolio management. But we've downgraded the fund to bronze just because Linehan's record obviously does not match Rogers. So I think that's one worth noting. Third Avenue Value, I thought it was interesting that Ian Lapey is gone, replaced by Chip Rui III. Uh, Chip doesn't have uh, much of a record. He has about a seven-year record, but he was only one of six managers. So we don't have that much to go on. We lowered that fund uh, to neutral. The last one I'd mention, Ivy Asset Strategy, where Ryan Caldwell uh, is leaving. We lowered that fund to neutral. One of the, he was a key uh, contributor to the fund, so that is why we have it at neutral. Originally, when he, his departure was announced, they said he was going to another company, but they would use him as a consultant to keep uh, contributing to the fund, which we thought was a really unusual arrangement. I think all sorts of potential conflicts of interest and compliance problems, and that's probably why they then changed gears and said, you know, we're just cutting ties and, and he won't be a consultant. So on the, on the one hand, you lose the, a good manager who was contributing. On the other hand, it, it seems a lot cleaner to me. Clearly, this is a challenging time for investors. But as we heard from our Morningstar experts, that doesn't mean it's time to panic. Stocks may be somewhat overvalued, but there are still pockets of opportunity. Fixed income may deserve a place in your portfolio, even in a rising rate environment. And the economy may not be firing on all cylinders, but it is moving in the right direction. Investors with a long-term time horizon and the right plan can still prosper. For Morningstar, I'm Jeremy Glazer. Thanks for watching.